until 10, 15 years ago, coaches and athletes weren't talking to each other. If somebody was in Louisiana, they weren't talking to people in California. And there was secret training programs. There were squat, secret squat programs and, and snatch techniques. that and, and people were – they actually didn't want to share, and a lot of that's changed. Yeah. How, how, did, uh, how did people learn how to lift, say, 20, 30 years ago? You know, I just heard that they finally figured out how to re um, renature proteins in egg whites. Oh, really? So you know how when you cook an egg white, it, it completely denatures and it's salt, it's solidified, and you can't ever go back. You can't like cool it back down, or it goes back to liquid form. Well, I guess they figured out they can now. Well, okay. The benefit of that is well, obviously, the, it's a chemistry benefit because now you can tra- change chemical properties that we never could before. I don't think they really particularly care about making egg whites again. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> but the chemical benefit is like we have a breakthrough now to change physical properties back to where we couldn't before. Yeah. Categor- okay. Categorically, now we have a million options, uh, not yeah. just with egg whites. Yeah, exactly. It's clearly not taking a complex movement pattern and making it simple. Yeah, no. clearly not. Not. No. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> that way, if you overcook, too, if you cook too many eggs, you can put it back in liquid and put it back in the fridge. That has okay. happened. Saving you cents at a time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's dollars at a time if it's African goose eggs. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Andy Galpin, and we have traveled to Bonzel, California, a whole 30 minutes from home, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, visit Coach Mike Bergner. And today we're going to dig into all the secrets of the industry, all the weightlifting yeah. secrets. Uh, we're going to peel back the, the curtain. <laughs> Coach B has all the secrets. I have they're, all they're, they're locked the away in there. Yeah, we're going to dig them out. I'm old enough now that I can say that, right? I have all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about before the show, one of the things we want to dig into is uh, weightlifting has gone through a big change. I know we have talked before about how CrossFit impacted it, but – I uh, want to talk about how the internet has impacted it because until 10, 15 years ago, coaches and athletes weren't talking to each other. If somebody was in Louisiana, they weren't talking to people in California and there was secret training programs. There were squat, secret squat programs and, and snatch techniques that, and, and people were, they actually didn't want to share and a lot of that's changed. Yeah. How, how, did, uh, how did people learn how to lift, say, 20, 30 years ago. No, uh, if you were lucky, you got uh, the Strength and Health magazine by uh, you know Bob Hoffman, York Barbell Club, and and guys like Bill Starr and uh, you know John Grimmick would mm-hmm. write articles about this great system called Five Sets of Five. You know, and then there was all kinds of ways of doing five sets of five. You could do progressive sets at different percentages, and you'd want to end up with one heavy single. And then, of course, as everybody overtrained and they wanted to do more, they would do more, and they'd do five sets of five with three sets at 80% and two sets at 85%. And then eventually ended up doing all five sets at 85%, and they really overtrained. And uh, But it was the the barbell you know york barbell club program is written by bill Starr, and that it was like the american bible Mm -hmm. for for strength training is this why all all these russian programs seemed uh so it was mysterious and it seemed to be working and what was that like trying to thinking about what the russians were doing and they had all these percentages and stuff well it was just something that was entirely different because metviev came out with all his counting of reps and counting of load and and you know and then the the periodization model that came out by a guy by the name of alan ball who was with the duncan ymca and in uh, uh that era and you know it was like totally different and from what we knew and understand but our only information was from the york barbell club and from bob hoffman and it was 90 percent of our our information was five sets of five you know if you do five sets of five in the snatch and five sets of five in the clean and jerk and five sets of five in the back squat and the front squat and the pulls and 
you know, then you'd be good to go. And, of course, back then it was you had three lifts. You had the snatch, or excuse me, you had the clean and the press, and then you had the snatch and you had the clean and jerk. So you had to put your program all together that was going to take care of all of those attributes. And so, uh, you know, five sets of five seemed like to be the way to go because it was simple and it'd make you strong. And uh, But it didn't address the weaknesses that you had of the body. Isn't that an originally why Star created that whole idea of you're going to do five by five, but it's going to be the uh, it's it's going to be the, the the power clean, the overhead press, and then the squat, right? And, and that was like the American football version of it. Right. And I I've, I've heard I don't know if this is true or maybe you can tell me if it's true or not that originally his his first hope was to do the overhead press and people were kind of nervous or scared about that. So then he said fine the incline press, and that didn't work. So they said fine and it devolved to the bench press. But because that's what was you actually needed to do that because the way you performed the clean and press was to basically lean backwards mm-hmm. and press it. So the bench press was very sport specific at, at that time. Yeah, the the Olympic press, which is I think a, a great exercise personally, but it was basically a push press without bending your knees. But you would end up squeezing your abs together and thrusting that weight up and then leaning back into it. And so the bench press was very very important for us to get strong uh and we did incline benches as well but just not as effective as we did with the bench press and yeah. some of the pictures of guys doing that are are, are pretty extreme like oh, with yeah. the, i mean they're they, they're locked they're locked knees but they're like they're like way back here yeah pressing the weight and then then when they would stand and up and drop stand it up through it exactly um, yeah. it it looks it looks like they're uh i don't know the exact term but they're I don't know if cheating is the right word. Like you see that, you'd be like, "Oh, like no one's ever going to count that lift. Like how is that even a thing?" Yeah. Or they're going to they're going to obviously hurt themselves or fall over backwards. Even right. um, it, the, some of the guys that are really good at were really extreme. Yeah, and that and I was pretty good at it. That was my that mm-hmm. was my deal that I could I could clean and press a lot of weight. And you know, it wasn't strict military press where you put your heels together and you just pressed it straight up and down with no back lean. It was actually you got to. Th- I ended up learning how to actually learning how to press from Russell Nipp, who was an American record holder in the in the clean and press. And mm-hmm. I actually learned how to crunch my abs together and squeeze my butt together and, and drive that weight up and then re-bend underneath huh. it without re-bending my knees. Yeah, I feel like most coaches, if they walked into a, a CrossFit gym or a weightlifting gym these days and they saw someone do um, a clean and press where they leaned back like, like that, they'd be like, what are you doing in here? Like, how are you even allowing that? Like, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was so different than, than how we perceive a, like a regular push press these days. Yeah, and, and it, it was different. And, uh, of course, you know, today's standards are you would, you would never do that kind of thing. You know, it's just, yeah. uh, it's just not – it wouldn't be acceptable, you know. What you were talking about, you were engaging your, your glutes and then your abs. Were you sending, a, like, a wave of energy up your spine, essentially, and then letting it explode through your hands? Yeah, well, you think about a push press where you actually bend the knees and you thrust it up and you drive it up with those legs and hips getting that acceleration on the barbell. Well, you did the same thing. Mm-hmm. But I would explode this up by squeezing the glutes, yep. squeezing the abs, and then it would be boom, and the you know it would come up through here, and and then the bar would probably just like the dip and the drive would get about you know a little bit above the head, and then I would time it where you would drive your hips forward, and push your body back under the bar. Yeah, huh. and then of course you'd have to stand up and hold the weight overhead. And the signal was is that once you clean the weight, you'd have to get set, and the referee in the front would give you a clap, go, and then at that point, you could drive the weight, you know. And so there were different ways of getting set. Some, some people would sit back and get set, and then the referee would give the clap sign, and then he would drive up and go from there. Mm. I stood up, and then I got that little rebound, which was yeah. as long as the knees didn't bend, then it was okay. Do, do you have any idea what roughly the percentage would be between the clean and press and the clean and jerk? Like the clean and jerk, I would think, would be a much higher total or a much higher lift. And then compared to that, what are people pressing? Well, it depends on who the person is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, am I say, the same for you? Yeah, the same for me. They, what ended up happening, I could clean and press the same as I could clean and jerk because I was hampered by the clean. Mm. And, of course, mm. and I was too stubborn to work my weakness, which was the clean. Yeah, you know, you'd think that. Uh, okay, well, okay, dumbass. If you're, if you're, cl- if you're cleaning, you know, and pressing the same as you're cleaning and jerking, you obviously need to work on that clean a little bit. What? Mm. Why didn't? Why didn't you do it? Because I didn't have a coach that knew what the hell they were talking about. 
Yeah. And we all did the same workout. There was, a, okay, you're going to do my workout, you're going to do my workout, you're going to do my workout, and I'm going to do my workout. Guess what? But your needs are different than my needs, so your workout should be different. But no one back then even thought about that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Mm. And you were talking about, I was calling it a wave coming up your spine because I, I've witnessed recently, you know, I, I think a lot of times uh, in sports training, we think about drive with the hips, really solid back don't let it move at all and then and it, that directly transfers the energy but i've been seeing some people who do use a, like a wave of contraction up their spine and using that in order to throw right and see some people throw some pretty heavy things really far yeah so yeah. and i don't i don't see that taught anywhere i mean yeah. i haven't been taught how to do that yeah but i've i've witnessed it at this point so I, i'm actually curious to see could you could you teach that now i don't know if i could it, it, to me it was intuition you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I watched Fred, you know, Fred Lowe. I watched Russell Nip, and these guys were great pressers. And I just, I'm, I'm a very visual person, so I mimicked what I saw. Gotcha. And the other nice, nice thing that, you know, the reason I became good at it, because at Notre Dame at the time, I was, I was playing football there, and my strength coach, Father Lang, gave us goals, right? And uh, the goals was, if you can press body weight 10 times, Huh. then he would give you 25 bucks or whatever. And of course this is back in the sixties. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, I can do this, you know? And so one goal was to hang for five minutes from a pull-up bar. Have That's, you ever tried that? Okay. I have tried time. that. Yeah. I'm good for about, I think my best is two minutes or something like That's that. That's still really good. Right. And, yeah. and it was anyway, so that's the way we made money. And so I became a good, <laughs> I, I became a good presser because of father Lang and his, you know, desire to help us pour students out and i was one of them and uh hell i ended up probably making in my four years at notre dame probably a thousand bucks off the of father line doing this Dang. these goals <laughs> of course today you can't i mean it's totally illegal you can do it but back then it was you know no one really cared mm -hmm. so ncaa would be coming in they would be coming in they'd take that national championship off the books <laughs> of course no one lifted weights but about there was about five guys on that 66 national championship team that lifted weights for football you mean yeah yeah back then it was just father lang was of all the universities that i visited to you know that offered me scholarships notre dame was the only university that had a weight room mm -hmm. you know, and, and it was by father lang who put all the money into it and raised the money for it and built all the equipment and of course, you know, back then it was all free ways. You didn't have machines. I think he actually made a contraption with the pulleys and did a lap pull down machine. You mm -hmm. know, but it was plate loaded, like the regular plates. You know, you put yeah. it on the post. And uh, so anyway, but Era Parsegian, who was my coach, really saw the value of you know kids coming in in the high school weighing 165, 170 pounds, but they want he wanted them to be 100 and. 85 yeah. pounds and yeah. so weightlifting made sense to him it, yeah. uh, strength training really didn't take off in the <laughs> collegiate setting until Floyd Epley in Nebraska right. got it going exactly when does any time stick out in your mind that it, it really exploded nationally well I think Epley was the reason why I mean you know he had that I forget the guy, coach's name that at Nebraska but Epley was a pole vaulter and he used weight training as I understand it and uh, their their football coach said that he wanted Epley to train these guys and get mm -hmm. these guys strong, and Boyd took it over. But the real, the first strength coach in all of America for weight training was Father Lane at Notre Dame. But he just wasn't recognized. I mean, Bob Hoffman recognized him, uh, and Bob Hoffman would send him barbells, and he'd send him a leg press one time, I think it was, and uh, all this other stuff. But Father Lang was the true you know, start of, I believe, weightlifting in the collegiate setting, you know, with the 1953, you know, I think it was 1953 national championships in uh, collegiate, in the collegiate nationals. Mm -hmm. But Epley was the guy that actually organized it, got it started, and I think he was a real instrumental in raising the funds at the University of Nebraska and putting in this humongous weight room. Yeah. Uh, and you gosh, the big red, the machine, yeah. was known for you know, for their strength program. Turns out that lifting stuff kind of works. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Those yeah. guys got really big and strong. Oh, big and strong and fast. And, and won a lot of games. Won, won a lot of games. Bob Devaney, was it? I think the football coach's name was Bob Devaney, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. 
it'd be really interesting to go from no teams are doing structured strength training. I'm sure, I'm sure some guys on the team did their own thing here and there and push-ups and whatnot were, were still a thing back then. But if you went from all the teams in the NCAA or, or whatever it was, nobody's training with a structured strength conditioning program and then one team starts where the whole team is training <laughs> There's yeah. going to be a pretty big swing in how strong that team is relative to the rest of the teams uh, oh, in, the, yeah. in, in the country. Yeah. Well, you go back and, and just look at the history of it, and you take a look at – I mean, the largest man that played on my football team was a, an All-American. He's an All-Pro uh, defensive tackle named Mike McCoy. He was like 6'2 and weighed 280 pounds. Yeah. And I've never seen anybody that large. Uh, and, I mean, he could run okay, but, I mean, he wasn't – fast fast but today i mean you're looking at guys that are 320 pounds and running under five second 40s mm -hmm. and i really believe that it, it happens because that we are bigger we are faster we are stronger and that is because of strength training mm -hmm. and uh, back then the day is that no one lifted weights yeah i mean i mean yep. until epley comes along and then you see you see nebraska winning national championships and their offensive linemen are now hovering around you know 290 300 and and running fast uh but back in my day you know when i played no one was like that they just had a guy in the combine who's right around 300 pounds he'll probably be the number one pick in a few weeks uh, i think he was one of the third guys ever to be 300 pounds and jump over 40 inches in the vert oh my goodness damn really yeah <laughs> and you're wondering why these concussions are taking place yeah <laughs> I mean, I mean, you, yeah you want i mean you think about that kind of stuff and it's uh that's really hard you know when you mm -hmm. think about guys getting bigger stronger faster mm -hmm. and how much change can they do with the equipment mm -hmm. i mean they can make it lighter strong but i you know stronger but you have a helmet to helmet which is targeting today thank yeah. goodness mm -hmm. you have that helmet to helmet and man there's a lot of damage that can be if done. you've never been yeah. in the room with an nfl football player or at least a division one football player like you don't really understand how big of a difference it is right. between those athletes and your normal local really strong guy yeah uh, like when you watch them you know snatch 300 pounds having no clue what they're doing yeah. and you're yeah. like wow that could be 500 really fast yeah mm -hmm. or whatever you know, snatch 500 but you get the idea like yeah. you've seen them power clean 450 accidentally yeah mm -hmm. yeah like, geez hey, can you like, get that up to your shoulders from the floor yeah it's like oh that just happened yeah how do i do it yeah. one time okay show me five 500 cool like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just, they're so big and strong. It's unreal. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And, and But it's not just football. You take a look sure. at basketball. I mean, God, today, I, the other day, I was watching the March Madness and I saw this guy from Purdue that's yeah. seven foot two and weighs 290 pounds. That guy's a monster. Seven foot two. I mean, it's like, Jeez. okay. And those guys are, I'm telling you, that. I was really impressed with the play. These big guys are moving yeah. down the court, and you know the point guard is now six seven or something to that effect. But those guys all, you know, they all lift. They lift weights. Yeah. And Mike uh, Gatone and the Chicago mm -hmm. Bulls, you know, I mean, he was the uh, he was the guy that brought the weightlifting to the you know the, to that sport. It's exciting that we just got him back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he's back with USA Weightlifting. If you haven't heard that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was with Gatorade for a long time. Now he's back. So he is back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like a month ago. Okay. You know, so he's coming back or something like that. So good. That's so, gonna be a really good. Yeah. Thing. Him and him and Roger Nielsen and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know Mike and then uh, there's a guy down in Florida, Harvey Newton. They're sure. All, they're yeah. all really really big at one time in USA Weightlifting, and I know they've gone away, but now they're coming back. It sounds really good. Yeah. Isn't Pierce Themis involved now too? He is. He's uh, he's involved. I'm not I'm not exactly sure what his. He's the technical coach. Okay. He's the technical. director. Director? Yeah. Okay. Mm. yeah, I don't know exactly what that means in function, but I think, uh, I mean, I don't know, you can speculate, but it, if anything, it, it was a really good statement by USA Weightlifting to say we are trying to get very serious about this, and we're going to bring in one of the guys who's the best of all time. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I don't know how much coaching or programming or what exactly he's doing, but that's a really cool statement on their part, if anything. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think Phil Andrews is the director of mm -hmm. USA Weightlifting now, and he's in my mind, he's done a great job. Educationally, uh, he, he has acknowledged the the relationship between weightlifting and CrossFit, you know, and how thankful mm -hmm. he is that CrossFit has come along, you know, and uh, and made the sport more uh, adventurous for everybody. Because uh, when I was involved in, in USA Weightlifting, I mean, we had 3,000 members, 
yeah. uh, in the sport, you know, and I was, I was on the board of directors, but, uh, you know, you had to pass a hat to get a cold beer for God's sake, trying to, you know, <laughs> try to, try to get anything done. And then when CrossFit came along and, and, uh, started talking about the black box and I went to USA weightlifting and I said, look guys, I have this vision that we're going to get more and more kids involved because CrossFit is going to get these kids' parents involved and the kids are going to want to be like the parents. So we're going to take these kids and we're going to develop them. They thought I was nuts because mm. they couldn't understand why anybody would want to do 30 snatches or 30 clean and jerks, which is a name, Isabel and, and, you know, and Grace, uh, which is part of the CrossFit training. And I said, it's not about 30 snatches. It's not about 30 clean and jerks. It's about getting the kids involved with these parents that are going to be going crazy over this CrossFit. And uh, they thought, I, again, they thought I was nuts. They said, you're going to ruin your career. You, you can't do this. This is stupid. And then three years later, it's like, okay, well, maybe there is something. Because <laughs> those kids, they, they came in to... The other right hell the parents came into weightlifting yeah and they would want to go into do weightlifting contests and if you've ever been to a weightlifting contest it's the most boring thing in the whole world right? <laughs> <laughs> i mean you have the first lifter out on the platform and all of a sudden that first lifter who comes out lifts the lightest weights that first lifter is getting cheers people are yelling for yeah. it good job you could do it you know they're just going nuts over this stuff and it's all crossfitters the yeah, CrossFitters yeah. are lifting in weightlifting contests. And the stands, instead of having only the relatives at the, at, at the, at the meet for this kid. Oh, we couldn't even get our, our family to show up to our meet. Oh, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how many meets did we drive to? In fact, I remember one we went to in, oh, I want to say Chattanooga. In Chattanooga. Or something like mm -hmm. that. And I think I had to lift at like 105 because the only one in my weight class was a 14-year-old kid or something. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to get gold and then have this 14-year-old kid get silver. So I'm going or, to 105. Or get silver. Yeah. There, there's that option too. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that was the real fear. Yeah. 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 There's no winning in that, in that example. I actually looked for, for contests that didn't have anybody but me in there. So. <laughs> so I would get the gold and then somebody would say, well, how many people, how many lifted in this meet? And I said, oh, about 60. There's only one in my class. I never, <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that, that's, that's been the revelation. And now you take a look at, you know, Phil Andrews, and he's seen this, and he's, ca you know, capitalized on it. I mean, there's like 15,000 members of USA Weightlifting now. And the last three years in a row, we've had 150 at our spring meet. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Which is going on next weekend. We'll have another of that probably again. So yeah. Mm -hmm. we, so, just, we have to cut <laughs> off registration now all the time. I want to well, yeah. go back to the, the five sets of five. At what point did did uh, that become not a thing? I, I'm switching gears. This yeah. is a hard hard left we're taking. Yeah. <laughs> what? How? Like, at what point did uh, did was everyone doing five sets of five, and then someone thought maybe we should do something different? I, as I recall, the you know the the avenue of that switch came with a guy by the name of Alan Ball, which is the Duncan YMCA, and he brought us all up for we were at, at Notre Dame and you know I went to the University of Kentucky and got my master's there and, and we all came together and we would just go to different clubs the Duncan YMCA which is in Chicago and was an easy drive for us had a plethora of information because that's where Bob Guida started Alan Ball you know started up coming in <clears throat> he would lecture us on this new concept called periodization and he did it by putting the date of the national championships here in the center and then he started drawing a big circle mm. and around it and the farther away you were from the circle the more volume that you would do at a low intensity mm. high volume low intensity right so that's all of a sudden you're getting three sets of ten four sets of eight five sets of six and you would you'd break down the cycles and you'd put a dot in on this little well i don't even know what they call that daggum thing but you know <clears throat> there's a start and you know 15 weeks, 20 weeks away, there's the end. That's what you're going for. And you'd want to hit maybe six weeks out, you'd want to hit a particular number. And so you'd be on a high volume, low, you know, low intensity until you got to this point. And in between there, you would reduce the volume and increase the intensity until that date, a week before that date, you would hit very, very low volume and very, very, very high intensity. And people started making pretty, pretty good gains. But, you know, as, as we continue on with this quest, there's nothing wrong with five sets of five today. Right. I still like going to five sets of five. But I've learned that, for me, 
that if I'm going to put my athletes on a very heavy-duty strength cycle, then I can't expect those athletes to do very, very well in the Olympic lifts at the same time. Yeah. What I can do is I can give them a heavy-duty strength cycle, and then every day or every other day, they do a very, very light five sets of three at 30% of the, the snatch and the clean and jerk just so that they can keep the movement patterns going. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and that's, that's, I found that that's really been important for our development. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I've, I noticed over the years that my squat and, and other things may go up. And usually when my squat is going up big time, my snatch and clean and jerk is staying the same, or have, especially with the snatch has even gone down. Right, yeah. And then letting another cycle run through of training right. and then having the uh, more focus on the lifts. Right. And then watch those go up. And uh, I think... Yeah. I think a lot of athletes don't have the patience because, you know, a cycle might be 12 to 16 weeks. Mm-hmm. That means half the year you don't feel like you're getting stronger. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I like to look at, you know, my son Bo is the guy that really talked me into this style of training. And he would he would be um, – he would go up to, you know, John Welburn's place up in uh, – mm-hmm. and John, of course, is a big proponent of Louis Simmons. Mm-hmm. And uh, – uh, and, of course, everybody in my world thought Louis, you know, they thought him being a great strength coach for powerlifting. But in reality, he is a great strength coach, in my opinion. And he really has taken – I can take my athletes and send them to Louis, and with the instruction that I'm going to have you uh, snatch and clean and jerk with just the bar, you know, after every workout. I just want to keep those patterns going. And then, Louie, you can do whatever you want with it. You're going to identify the weaknesses of, of him, which is typically posterior chain in mm-hmm. his mind. Mm-hmm. And so he'll work with them really hard. And then my kids are still doing the snatch and clean and jerk, which is the bar. And they come back and they make humongous gains. So, it's it, you know, for me, that style of training, which is what we never did before. We did the five sets of five, you know, mm-hmm. type situation for everything. And... Uh, the weakness style of training, you know, if I'm weak in this particular area, I need to train that particular area. How I get to that training area is going to be pretty much high volume, you know, low intensity that moves into low volume, high intensity. That's the way we're going to do it. But I like to think of today that we now take the athlete and uh, if he deserves five sets of five, then that's what he gets. But that's only because he deserves it because that's his weakness. And uh, today, you know, it's it's much more scientific than it was back in our day. And it, like you alluded to earlier, you know, the, the Internet comes rolling around, you know, and all of a sudden you got, you know, people that are emailing back and forth. And I can remember the first meeting I went to with the uh, NSCA and some guys in there talking about emails. And I'm going, the hell's an email? <laughs> I didn't know, even know what an email was. And he's talking about this electronic letter that you get and i'm going how what, where's it come from <laughs> you know, it doesn't have a postage thing on it i mean i was totally oblivious to this stuff and now you can i can google whatever and youtube whatever and i can find out you know whatever i want to find out about you know well there were technology. quite a few coaches that were that still as the as information was becoming free and readily available for everybody there was i remember watching that happen and then a lot of coaches still trying to keep their things secret mm-hmm. and then you you could go find go download a spreadsheet somewhere and go oh i, I got the system <laughs> i or got some, the system yeah but the system was never geared towards the weakness of the athlete right and that's that's the bottom line is that you mean a small off squat program doesn't work for everybody all the time (laughs) (laughs) whatever it is it doesn't matter i mean and i get this all the time can you send me a program you know they can go to my website and get a free program you know and crossfit weightlifting gives you a free program but that's a very generic program it's it's geared for very general you know the very general person but if if i was going to coach all five of us in here all five of us would have different programs because we're not going to have the same strengths and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, you, you look at, you know, maybe, maybe Andrew's going to have f- five sets of five, you know. Uh, it's just my personal philosophy that I'm good five sets of five in the back squat, but I never do five sets of five in the front squat. I do five sets mm-hmm. of three. I've done ten sets of three. But that's very generic, and it's only my philosophy. And I freely give that away because I think there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, and they all work. 
but you know some are going to get skin better than others and and depends on what my needs are as, as an athlete you know mm-hmm. and that's what program i should be given yeah. So, you know, in our cycle right now, we've got a very strength cycle going. People are loving the cycle, but I'm giving them dumbbell bench presses, trap bar deadlifts. We're doing all this kind of stuff. But then the day two is nothing but snatch and clean and jerk at right. 20, 30 percent just to keep those movement patterns going. And they seem to like that. Now, we're going to come off of that in about six weeks. It's going to be a six-week cycle. We're coming off that. And we're going to go right back into the Olympic weightlifting cycle. Mm-hmm. How far out in advance do you program typically? Typically, it just depends on the, the competition schedule. Hmm. You know, I mean, when I look at, you know, my favorite cycle is a 16-week cycle that deals with four four-week cycles, hmm. the mesocycles. And it basically follows a, uh, a very generic type of template. Number one is I'm going to do a classical lift. I'm going to do a classical pull. I'm going to do a leg exercise. I'm going to do an overhead exercise. And I'm going to do a core. So there's five components within that template, and I can manipulate that template any way that I want to manipulate it based on the information that I'm given through your strengths and weaknesses and my evaluation of you. So if week number one is always going to be a little bit more volume, so I'm going to do three-position snatches as an example. I'm going to do snatch pulls. I'm going to do front squats with snatches. Why? I just like it that way. <laughs> there's no scientific background with it. It's just the way that I've always done it. I'm going to do some kind of front squat. You know, typically with the snatches, I like the front squat or an overhead squat if I want to. Uh, And then I'm going to do a core movement. And my core movement can be back extensions with a weight, Mm. you know. Uh, It can be stiff-legged deadlifts versus Romanian deadlifts because there's two different exercises there. So, again, it depends on the person that I'm dealing with. If I've got a really weak posterior chain, then, you know, I've got to really be careful because the front squat and the stiff-legged deadlift could be an overtraining method that I, I don't want to implore in that athlete who has a weak posterior chain. So. Gotcha. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about how to find weaknesses. Okay. Hey, guys. Doug Larson here from Barbell Shrug, uh, hanging out with Ray Regno here at CrossFit Stronghold. Uh, Ray is an awesome weightlifting coach. He was on episode 248, and uh, he was showing us a drill that we think is really cool and really unique that will help you pull under the bar. That way you can catch the heaviest weight possible in the bottom of your squat for your clean. So I'm going to turn it over to Ray, and he's going to show you a cool drill that I've never seen before. Hey, my name is Ray Regno. I'm part of the CrossFit Weightlifting Seminar staff with Coach Mike Bergner. We're here at my gym, CrossFit Stronghold in San Diego. We're also home of the Stronghold Barbell Club. What we're going to do today is we're going to show you a drill that you can use to teach your athletes, or if you're an athlete yourself, to teach you how to pull yourself down and around the bar to maximize the amount of weight that you can lift in the clean. Okay. What I've got is I've got a squat rack set up with some safety spotter arms. I've got it set up so that if I were to pull on the bar, it would hit the barrier and I can't pull the bar any higher. My feet are set wide. This is where I squat. I'm going to shrug myself down, keep my elbows high and outside. I'm going to pull myself down in the front squat position and receive the bar in this nice solid front squat. Okay, one more time. I'm going to initiate by shrugging myself down under the bar, elbows high and outside, turn my elbows around in the bottom and receive the bar in a nice solid front squat. Okay, why should you do this movement? If your power clean is heavier than your clean, you have some opportunity for growth. The way that we move the most weight is to actually pull the bar to about here. That's as high as it goes with the heaviest weight we can move. And then now we transition our body under the bar. So if you're trying to muscle the bar up, you're not going to get very far. The whole point of this drill is to teach you how to pull yourself down and under the bar and receive the most weight you can so you can hit that PR, win a competition, whatever it is. We want to be able to move as much weight as possible, and this is how we do it. All right, we're back. We, uh, we want to talk about finding weaknesses. So I think, you know, there's, I think most people get in weightlifting or the CrossFitters who get, you know, then over to weightlifting. I imagine that everyone's doing a lot of these big general programs like what we were talking about in the first half. And uh, are there common weaknesses that, that end up emerging from people doing, you know, the same types of programs? I, th- I think so in, in CrossFit, you know, 
especially with so I combine both weightlifting and CrossFit together because that's what our course is, is is being able to teach teachers and coaches how to teach Olympic style weightlifting to their clients in the CrossFit community, and that style has been used with me you know, even when I was a high school teacher, and then it's also been used with me as I was coaching weightlifting with USA Weightlifting, uh, but basically it was the identification of weaknesses comes from three components you have to have mobility speed and and you know your strength that's that's basically what we're looking for so when we when we look at our athletes and you start talking about you know that generalization of muscle dips muscle ups uh you know handstand push-ups where is that going to affect you more commonly Typically in the shoulders or, mm-hmm. you know, the shoulder joints, is r- they're really going to be in, inflamed and you're going to tighten it up. So if you don't have that, whether all to, you know, do your mobility exercises under tension, in my opinion, mm-hmm. then, uh, then you're really going to be put behind the eight ball, you know, when it comes to doing the Olympic lifts. So the f- very first thing that I do is that when I identify weaknesses of a particular athlete is it's always the mobility more than anything else. So, you know, if I have mobility issues with an athlete, then I'm going to have to address those mobility issues before well, I do anything else. I mean, if we're, if we're starting to work strength or speed, especially something like speed with bad mobility, the risk of injury is just, well, it's pretty much guaranteed. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's a very good observation. You're, you're now going to, you know, disengage what the snatch and what the clean and what the jerk are all about. Yeah. You know, the 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 movement patterns of, of those three uh, lifts is all about creating acceleration on the barbell. It doesn't have anything to do with the strength yet. I mean, of course we want to have our strength. The posterior chain is really, and probably 85% of American weightlifters, the posterior chain is really weak in my opinion. Uh, back in the day when Paul Anderson and Shemansky and, you know, Tommy Kono and uh-huh. all these great lifters were lifting, the posterior chains were very, very strong. And they would do back extensions, not glute hat and back extension, but back extensions with two and 300 pounds on their back coming up and pausing and going back down again. Why do you think we stopped doing that? Uh, I just think it becomes, in my personal opinion, there was just so much out there the invention of weight machines, uh, uh, you know, different exercises, uh, you know, come about. And everybody wanted to work everything. They wanted to work all the different exercises instead of just sticking to the basics. Back extension is one of the greatest exercises in the world as far as I'm concerned, you know. and uh, But it has to be as a stiff-legged deadlift. And this would be basically a contraption where you get in. It's a 45-degree angle. You load up. Would you put a barbell on your back? Oh, hell, not in the beginning, obviously. But, I mean, uh-huh. back in the day, we didn't have glute ham benches. Mm-hmm. I mean, back in the day, we had, what, those gymnastics plumber horses? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah. Roman chairs. The, the, yeah, we, well, actually, the, 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 the thing that, you know, we had the Roman chairs, but what we would use is the, that gymnastic plumber horse, and we would go put our bellies on it in between those two uh, handles, and somebody would be in the back holding our legs down. Mm-hmm. And we would reach down and pull this daggum bar, put it up over our head, and we'd do back extensions. And we'd go up and do back extensions and pause and put it back down again. Would you be, would you be rounding the back as you do this? Sure. Yeah. yeah, just like stiff-legged deadlifts. You always rounded the back. You go going down, you round the back. But if you talk about rounding the back now, you can't call it stiff-legged deadlift. You can call it Jefferson curl. Right. Yeah, you know, that's right, what right. Uh, the Chris Somer calls it, the Jefferson curl. Mm-hmm. If I taught stiff-legged deadlifts in my classes at the high school level, I probably would have been fired. So we caught Jefferson curls. Yeah. <laughs> Which, it seems like those are getting more and more popular they these are. days. Are, are you are you programming those in I, for your athletes? No, at any point? I'm, because I don't program those in at the at the at my website because I can't control it. Mm-hmm. Right. See, I want to be able to control what I program. I mean, okay, it's, people are going to snatch, they're going to clean and jerk, they're going to pull. These. And we give them instruction with that. Ray Regno, who I know you've dealt a lot with, he comes up mm-hmm. and does our little technique segments, you know, on a, on a weekly basis. And that's really helped a lot of people. But when it comes to stiff-legged deadlifts, and, and I'm talking about doing stiff-legged deadlifts, I have to have instruction in that, you know, with my athletes before I'm going to program 
something like that for him. And that's mm-hmm. just basically for the legality issues more than anything else. Right. But I really believe in stiff-legged deadlifts. Mm-hmm. I believe it's uh, one of the best tools that one can have in developing the posterior chain, just like glute, just like the back extensions, not glute hand back extensions. You know, so mm-hmm. I, I love that exercise. Do you, do you think guys, uh, you know, decades ago, like you were just mentioning, um, have a stronger or had stronger posterior chains in part because they did a lot more manual labor? Mm-hmm. I think that that's a very good point. I, I'd i probably just say yes. They were just stronger overall. You know, and then as we become more technolized, then you, you go that hard manual labor kind of goes, goes away with it. You mm-hmm. know, with well, I think a lot of people spend most of their day being sedentary, you know, mm-hmm. whereas even if it wasn't hard physical labor, yeah. people in their work were moving around. Right. It was just physical activity was higher. Right. Yeah, I remember my strength coach, he, growing up, he was he was on a farm in a lot of cases, and he, he bailed a lot of hay as an right. example. And so, like, he'd go lift weights and play football, and then the rest of the time he was bailing hay. Right, exactly. And he, he, was, he was commenting uh, on, you know, the, the guys that he grew up training with versus, like, the kids that he trains now are just a world apart. It's yep. like you come in, you, you, play, you play video games, you, you go to school, you sit at, you sit at desk, um, you're on the computer, et cetera, and you're not out on a farm bailing hay and, and doing like like heavy activities all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, your your base just simply isn't there in the same way. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, the houses when I grew up were all you know heated with coal, and so down in my basement, I had my dad had a uh, a furnace that was fed by coal, and the the coal would come from the center and stoke itself into the into the furnace, and that would heat the house. Well. Part, one of my jobs was to get into the coal bin and start shoveling, you know, the coal back into the middle of the furnace that fed the, or the, the bin that fed the furnace. And so when you think about baling hay and you think about shoveling that coal or you think about shoveling the, the horse dung or the cow dung or whatever from the farm, you're doing a lot of rotational stuff. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's one of the biggest issues that we have as, as weightlifters today is that we don't train how much rotational work do you do, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, to strengthen up that area at the core? Well, that's a, yeah. <clears throat> that's a good question. Like, with, with the template you laid out earlier, you had a kind of a classical lift, you had a pull, you had some type of a leg movement, like a squat, you had an overhead movement, you had a core movement. Right. Um, for all the kind of extra assistance type stuff, you know, maybe some of this falls into the core category that I just mentioned, but, like, for pull-ups or, or rows or or anything else that's not something that strictly falls into one of those five templatized um, – categories where do you program in these other things i program it in like an opposite day for an example uh yeah. here here's a, a big example is that you take that template and you divide it into those five movement patterns but i can do three of those movement patterns on monday huh. and i can do tuesday i can do the, the last two or even more of the core if i want to mm. so a typical thing for me might be to do three three position snatches snatch pulls and snatch push press well, so now I got on Tuesday, I'm going to do front squats, and I'm going to do back extensions or, you know, whatever my core I want to do. My, my box jumps would be part of my core development training. Mm-hmm. Pull-ups would be part of my core development training. Even barbell curls nowadays, you know. I mean, you see so many people with that hyperextended elbow mm-hmm. that when they're overhead. And, you know, nowadays I will actually program and that barbell curls or dumbbell curls for that athlete to try to get them a little bit stronger so that that elbow will be stronger as well making that bicep stronger yeah uh, of course having strong biceps and, and just strong elbow flexion in general is a good thing absolutely as long as you don't as long as you don't put it on a pedestal where where bench press and curls is like just all you do there's certainly nothing wrong with yeah. with having strong pecs and strong biceps and yeah. like the beach muscles so to speak as long as you don't overemphasize them. Well, that's been the problem, uh, I think, within... I, I'll certainly say this for me. I went through a time period where I was only going to do snatch, clean, jerk, and squat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was it. Right. You know, I mean, it, the Bulgarian method for me made sense. Mm-hmm. But it didn't... So from there, the snatch, clean, jerk, and squat made famous by Abijaya from Bulgaria, mm-hmm. you know, that mm-hmm. was something that, well, that makes sense. That's our sport. We're going to snatch, clean, jerk, and squat. Well, then we thought, well, gee, many Christmas, what about the weaknesses of this athlete? You know, so now we're going to snatch, clean, jerk, and squat and work on the weakness. So we changed the name from the Bulgarianized program to the Americanized Bulgarian program, which became the snatch, clean, jerk, and, and squat and working your particular weaknesses. Mm. And that is something that I really believe in, but I don't believe in it where we're going to the one rep max 
right every day on, right. on a on a daily basis you know i mean I, I believe that you can you work to that i still believe in the high volume you know uh, low intensity and and working on your technique and doing tempo pulls and and doing tempo pause pulls at the at the six different positions of a snatch or a clean doing that kind of stuff to really develop that and and that develops great strength as well while you tr- try doing those tempo pulls with no pause hitting all six of those positions and taking 10 seconds to get up to a, a mm. final finish mm. it'll definitely kick your hind in you know and then yep. going back down and and going back up for two sets three sets of two mm. reps that takes 20 seconds or 10 seconds up and 10 seconds down 10 seconds up 10 seconds down it really develops that good isometric contraction too you know and when's the last time that you've done isometrics yeah i've gone back to doing some isometrics now with some Mm -hmm. of our athletes because i believe that that's one of the patterns that we used to do years and years ago but kind of got away from it but i think there's a place for it in various lifters uh programs depending on the on the lifter yeah what what would because i like isometrics for anytime there's joint pain Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it's a way to keep the muscle strong and right. take the load off the joints and actually help them out a lot more. Yeah, yeah I've had some mm-hmm. patellofemoral pain in my right knee lately, and so I've been doing deadlift isometrics, just bottom of the deadlift position, just pull maximally against an immovable object, right. and it doesn't bother my knee at all. But I feel like I'm still getting some high tension in that in that bottom position. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a big deal with uh, that, that we did with you know with our lifters, you know. Uh, Guy, what's it? Smitty, the guy that was the strength coach for Bob Benarski and uh, the guy for uh, York Barbell Club years ago. I mean, he put mm-hmm. us through an isometric pulling program where you did pulls from one inch above the ground. You know, you just bar comes up and you're pulling against that immovable mm-hmm. object. Mm-hmm. And then you'd take one inch below the knees and then one Ooh. inch above the knees. And then you'd be into that scoop position and you'd drive hard here. And he would only have you do one set. One set of that six-second pulls mm-hmm. maximum, and you're, and you're lifting a heavy weight. I mean, it's not just a bar against a movable object, but, I mean, he's got a weight on there. So um, if, if you had a 300-pound snatch. You can't let up at all. You no. can't because as soon as, as soon as you're pulling, that bar wants to pull you back down, but you're really pulling hard with that 300-pound bar mm-hmm. against that immovable mm-hmm. object. And I will tell you right now, you go through that program, and it is like OMG. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> like, oh, you couldn't do anything. If you try to lift too much, if you want to do two or three sets of that, mm-hmm. the next day you were toast. You wouldn't be able to do anything for a week. Mm-hmm. It was the hardest, most intense program of isometrics that carried over in a positive way to my lifting. We mm-hmm. had Coach uh, Cal Dietz on about oh, yeah. a year ago, and he has this triphasic system where it's the first set of the program is eccentric, and then it's isometric, then concentric. And so after that show, I was like, you know what? Actually, I haven't done anything isometric in probably a decade or more. Right. Mm-hmm. So we went back and did it, and we probably did eight weeks or something of it. And one, I noticed I was terrible in a lot of those positions. Right. Horrible. Yeah. And then I also noticed my strength just shot up of doing only the isometric portion of his right. program. Mm. And my wife, who has only been lifting for a handful of years, her quality of movement went up so fast because she couldn't get away with little crap movements at the Mm. bottom bouncing out of control she had to stop control position and then move it and so her technique just shot through the roof because she had to own that position to control it to be able to move it again it was really really good so we actually come back to it a lot now um with for a lot of things we've done some Mm -hmm. pause snatches and stuff like that but Mm -hmm. this was a true program if you really want to own the position i really think for beginners, Isometric. it's a very good place to start. Yeah. I'm imagining, I'm imagining doing this with an overhead squat now. Yeah, so I mean, jeez, like, just <laughs> like overhead squat, pin, you know, maybe 100 pounds on a bar, and then pin it and just push against that. Yeah. Well, you know what? That, I, I immediately go to the most difficult thing I can imagine. Well, you, can, <laughs> you, you what's really going to be amazing because you're going to push up on that immovable object, right? Yeah. And you've got 100 pounds on there, or whatever that figure is, yeah. that number is, and you're pushing up against it, and then all of a sudden. You're pushing as hard as you can, and what happens? You start to yep. you start to go down, yep. and it's like, oh shit! I'm pushing up as hard as I can, but I'm really I have nothing left, right? And I go down under, you know, I go. So down. you're suggesting like a, a six second max? I, you know, I don't. I, I think we ended up doing six seconds. Was what I think the yeah. protocol was yeah. at the time was six seconds max hold, and we did them with bench presses. We did them with presses. I mean, we're pushing up hard against this pin, and if you take a look at the old 
style of rack that I have in there that Hoffman had, the huh? York Barbell had, those pens were what, one inch, one inch away from each yeah, other, and mm-hmm. you'd, you'd take the pens and put them in, and you'd you'd have the bottom pin because there was no way you could, uh-huh. you could hose. You'd push hard up here, and then all of a sudden you're going, ah, you're going down, you're going down, you're trying to push it, and you, and you were toast. You, could, you had to have a safety catch there mm. to do that. But there, there is no doubt, in, in my opinion, that that is uh, one of the best bang for the buck when it comes to getting strength training done. Yeah. And, so- and, and, and for me, anyway, the, the fundamentals of teaching weightlifting is our stance, grip, and positions. Stance and grip are easy, pretty much. You know, I mean, that, that depends on you and where you're at. But the positions, there, how many positions are there in the snatch? Infinite. I mean, <laughs> there, there, there really is. And, and I identify six positions in my pulls. And you've got to get strong in each one of those positions. And you think about taking a 300-pound snatch, that, which your max is 300 pounds, and you address that bar and you lift that bar one inch from the ground. Mm. And you hold it there for two seconds. Mm. And then you come in one inch below the knee. And you hold it there for two seconds. And then you've got to clear the knees out of the way. You don't want to go around the knees. And you clear the knees out of the way and you go one inch above the knees. Mm. Now you've got to make sure that the feet are balanced, that the shin is perpendicular to the ground, that the shoulders are over the bar, and the back is nice and arched, and you're looking straight ahead. Those are the five points of performance. And then all of a sudden, now I'm going to start extension. Now, I mean, my knees are now going to, you know, my hips are going to extend. The knees are going to re-bend mm. back under the bar. That's where the scoop comes in. So we get that. We call that the hang mm. position. We're right at here at about mid-thigh. That's our hang. And then you go to that scoop position, which we call the down, and you hold that. And then you go to the finish, and you hold that. Holy cow. I mean, you're getting strong in every one of those positions. Would you would you pick one position per day or? No, we do all six of them. You do all you so. No, if I was doing isometrics, then I would do today's an isometric day. You're going to do one set and get the hell out of here because that's all you're going to be able to do. So maybe you would do a whole workout and then finish with that. No, or, I uh, would, this, that would that, be your that workout. That would be my workout, and I would actually have isometrics where you're pulling up against the bar. One set, six seconds, one inch off the ground. One set, six inches, one inch below the knee. One set, six seconds, one inch above the knee. One set, six inches, hang, scoop, up. And, you know, you'd have to go accordingly. And that would be it. Because I'm telling you right now, after you've done that, you are toast. And your recovery ability is absolutely non-existent if you do more than that. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be tired for three or four days. I've been there. I've done it. I've overtrained on that so many times. It's unbelievable because it doesn't seem like... You're doing much until the next freaking day. And then it's like, oh, I don't feel good. <laughs> I feel some experiments coming on. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think you should try it and see. And uh, and then, of course, everybody's different. You know, everybody's ability to recovery, mm. recover is, mm-hmm. is, is different, you know. so We've been playing with this same idea, too, for diagnostic of breathing quality. Mm. So you get into these bad positions, or, or not bad positions, but you get into these challenging positions. Mm-hmm. You imagine the overhead mm-hmm. uh, squat. Now right. you hold it for 10 seconds. Don't do it maximally, but just hold it for 10. You'll notice very quickly, am I breathing? Because <laughs> if you're not, then probably what's happening is you're doing your set of 10 or 12 or set of 30. My God. Okay, so now we can, I can tell you very quickly, maybe your squat looks good technically, but you're not breathing, so we're not there yet. Yep. And so it's a very quick diagnostic. So Kelly has this... Uh, funny thing he's doing right now with 100 kilos back squat for a minute kelly Hold, start yeah holding the bottom for a minute holding the bottom for a minute he's insane Jeez. yeah right now he's we can't like, get there maybe it's 20 kilos for you or a bar but yeah yeah like see see if you really in his words own those positions if you can't breathe you're going to get exposed over I've the course been, of that minute i'd say over the last year i've been doing uh, not like that but i make sure to take a full breath at the bottom yeah let it all out bring it all in while maintaining position yeah while bracing like being able to definitely breathe, be breathing, breathing. And bracing. for sure, for sure. That's a key word right there. Bracing. Yeah, there's a fundamental difference between breathing and bracing, and if you don't understand that, that should tell you exactly what you need to work on. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. I, I give the example all the time in my class. If you can't take your thumb, you should be able to push out. Okay, now you should be able to yeah. do that, and then you should also be able to talk. If you're listening, what Andy's right. doing is he's pressing his thumbs into his sides. D- what, right above my ASIS, my anterior spirial X spine, right, just a little bit outside of that, you should be able to move <laughs> your thumb. You know, that muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> That's a bone. Right? <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but more importantly, you should be able to move your thumbs with your abs, and then while they're out there, you should be able to talk. If you can't, you can't breathe and brace. Now, what? because if that's not happening, 
at the bottom of your squat, either you're losing bracing or you're losing breathing. One of the two. Now you should be able to move those thumbs out there, hold that, continue to talk, and now be able to go into your full squat position. And if you lose either the talk or the thumb tension in the bottom, you've probably got some, some issue there. Mm. Good point. When, when you're coaching athletes, how do you teach them to breathe or brace? I don't, or both I don't during teach, the lifts? I don't teach them anything. You don't, you don't mention because it Because I just, what ends up happening, the only time I really talk about, you know, the, the breathing aspect is that obviously, and you can watch the videos of Olympic style weightlifters that right before they clean the weight or right before they snatch the weight, they'll go down at the bottom and they take a deep breath in, they'll feel that diaphragmic type yeah. breathing and they'll explode. And they're not going to be in the bottom, and at least in my in my observations, they're not going to be in the bottom, and sit there and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know breathe in, breathe out. What happens right. is I tell my athletes don't let go of your air until the referee puts the light down, and then you let go of the air. Mm-hmm. On the clean, it's a little bit different because I do the clean, I stand up, <sighs> I get all my breaths that squared away, and then I fill my stomach full of air probably hopefully to the effect that you're talking about and then i dip and i drive the weight overhead and i have that weight inside my air right here my stomach as i recover and i hold it up there until the referee gives me the white light and then i let the work yeah. let, it, let mm-hmm. it down so we do talk about breathing like that but the biggest issue that i talk about breathing is is making sure that i'm consistent with my technique in my breathing pattern for an example in the jerk if i have an athlete that's getting ready to dip and they're doing all this stuff and they get set and then they want to go too big of a hurry and they don't brace yeah. by breathing it collapse <gasps> yep and they collapse down here whereas i try to get my athletes to sit brace <gasps> Boom, or breathe, brace, whatever you want to call it, and then dip and drive. And that goes, it's going to give them a 1,001 count, and then you dip the same way every single time. Because when I take in air and non-brace, I never know what the hell the dip's going to be. 90% right. of the time, it's probably going to be out front. I'm going to dip forward, and the bar path's going to be out front. But if I can get that pattern down of brace, breathe, or breathe, brace, whatever the hell you want to say, and I expand the rib cage to make sure I have a good platform for the bar up here, and I'm an elbows down and out type yeah. of a jerker, and then I can drive drive from there. Yeah, yeah. So. it's it's very hard. I'll right, back up. One of the, n- the nice things about being heavy and overhead is it becomes very difficult to do that if you're not braced in your core. Right. So as you're saying, if you're doing a lot of heavy overhead work, Sometimes you don't necessarily need to tell them to turn your core because it's going to be tough to get in that position and if you're not and not be on, right? But inversely, though, if you're not doing that stuff heavy, you can get away with it, right? Right. So the you know if you're doing heavy clean and jerks and snatches, you're probably okay there. That that brings me to a point too is that you take a, a guy like Chris Somers or the other guys that are gymnastic oriented or this, you know, you got to understand that it takes a lot of time to develop the technique for Olympic style weightlifting. And it's it's like you've got to cover the fundamentals. You've got to cover the the very general things and get strong in all those positions that, that we have to have. And you have to know what the positions are. But if, if somebody came up here to my gym and I brought them up here and they've never done the snatch or clean jerk and they watch somebody do it and you ask them to identify what they're doing, explain what's happening here, 90% of those people would say, well, he's just pulling the bar over his head and he's dropping under it. And it is so far and in the CrossFit community, that's exactly what takes place because you think of the, you know, the 40-year-old housewife that now all of a sudden has got her three kids and her three kids are going to school and she's got her best friend has lost all this weight doing CrossFit. And she comes in and you've got a 20-year-old, a 21-year-old coach that's going to teach her how to snatch and clean and jerk. Well, she doesn't know anything about the snatch and clean and jerk, but she's the one that's explaining, yeah, I pulled the bar up over my head. So the fundamentals of, 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 of stance, grip, and positions, the fundamental of teaching, you know, stance, grip, and positions become absolutely paramount. You have to get those patterns down, and you have to get yourself strong in those patterns before you actually snatch and clean and jerk. If you can do that, and you can be patient with that, and the coach can make it fun so it is patient, and you can do your homework at home with PVC pipe, hitting those positions and holding there in an isometric position, even with the PVC pipe, then you're going to be better off in the long run. Yeah, Maybe- what I'm getting out of this whole thing is setting up like one inch at a time. Absolutely. And working that position. And because I, I, I see so many times people who, you know, they can hold a position with a PVC pipe or an empty bar. And as soon as the weight feels heavy, they just start skipping positions. Right. Because they're weak in that position. And, Getting them to, to stop and slow down is 
big challenge. Yeah. Most people, you know, the ego gets in the way. That's, and, that is it. And I, I think the the isolation hold would be a good ego dissolution exercise. Well, you, <laughs> so I like what Somer says yeah. is that he talks about that very thing about saying, look, it takes you five years to get to 50% of your capability. And that's gymnastics, mm. Mm. right? You know, and hell, I even went out and bought his gymnastics, you know, his, his first program. Oh, you got suckered in too? No, I got oh, suckered man. in too. And guess what? <laughs> guess what? Because you can't go to one level and, and, unless right. you. you right. So I'm still at the first level, the first exercise. I'm trying to do crab walks again, you know, and it's yeah. like, mm-hmm. okay. It's funny how that works. You go back to it. Like everyone, like I, the last time I got that program, I was maybe five years ago. And now everyone, you know, it seems like every two or three years, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go look at. <laughs> Fuck, man! I've gone back to my progression again. Yeah. Yeah, that foundations course is really good. Oh, it's it really, really is. I highly it, recommend it, it. Yeah, it is. It's really good. And and you know, he, Chris does a great job, and he doesn't pull any punches. It's, why would you want to go to level two if you're not done with level one? Well, yeah. weightlifting's the same way. Yeah. Why do I want to go to, you know, level two if I can't if I don't have the mobility? See, so my big deal is mobility, speed, and strength. So if I if I got my mobility down. My speed is going to come anyway because I'm going to teach you how to time the pull yourself. You don't drop under a barbell. You don't catch a barbell. You explode through the ground, you know, ankle, knee, and hip extension, basically, create an acceleration on the barbell. Then you pull your body down and around in the snatch, down and around the barbell, and then you punch yourself through that through that barbell. And that's the critical aspect. So, so if I've got my mobility I'm, the speed, how can I pull a barbell up if I'm off the ground? If my feet are sliding out, so I've got this area, I've finished, and now I'm going to turn it over, but my feet are sliding out at the same time as I'm turning over. That's where my speed comes from. From that turnover, and my feet are off the ground, now I punch myself down underneath that barbell. If I catch the barbell, there's going to be a give there. That's catching, for me, sends a, sends a vision of, catching a baseball, catching a football, you know, I want to punch my body underneath that bar. Yeah. That, that was a big moment for me when I realized that I need to be as aggressive with my arms and shoulders Absolutely. as I'm being with my hips. Absolutely. Because, and I think there was some confusion in the beginning because there was, there's so much discussion around weightlifting and hip drive, hip drive, or even leg drive. Right. But people talk about that 10 times more often than they're talking about, you know, shoulder, elbow, you know, hand drive. Yeah. And then once I once I started putting as much effort into that turnover and punch up, all of a sudden it felt better on my shoulders sure. and could do more weight. Sure. No, that that's I think that's the most important part. You can I mean, depending on what your philosophy is, I'm a vertical hip person. I like mm-hmm. the Russian Polish technique. Uh, and I really try to teach that. Doesn't doesn't mean that, you know, that the hips and the bar don't meet. The hips and the bar meet automatically. It's not something that I want my athlete to do. I don't want them to bring the bar into the hips, but the hips and the bar, if you keep that bar close to the body, the hips and the bar meet, and there's an actual brushing action with a vertical pattern. To me, what ends up happening too much, if I think too much hips, and it gives gives me too much to think about, it's like taking a barbell, and I can be in the high, elbows high and outside as I'm going underneath that barbell. Now, what happens if I pull in that barbell, you're not going to get that barbell from me because it's real close and I'm real strong. But the moment I slip this thing out outside that least line of resistance, now what happens? Try to pull the barbell away from me, and you got it just for a second. You've got that. I'm I'm outside my strength base, out out mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. out of my uh, efficiency pattern is what I want to say. So, it's very important for me to be strong in that position. All the various positions through the lift, I have to be strong in each one of them. Yeah. So I, I feel like if I if I ask the average crossfitter, like you know, what do you do for mobility or what do you do to get stronger, they would have a lot of answers for me in in a, in a bunch of different categories, but. You mentioned speed as the third component, and I feel like that's not emphasized as much. What, what do you do for drills or, or movements or, or just mindset around being fast? One of the, the – and I always talk about under tension, you know, that stretching under tension. So the burden of warm-up consists of five exercises, and the skill transfer exercises, there's five of those as well. And out of that, out of those ten exercises, four of those exercises have to do with footwork and speed. So that's how important it is. So, you know, when, when I do the burden of warm-up on a daily basis, I mean, the down and finish is speed through the middle. That's driving with the legs straight up and down. And, and I put that in there because I am the hip vertical, 
philosophy guy. So I put that down and finish up here. Where I used to, is in the very beginning of my teaching, I still believe the same way, but I taught everything from the hang position, and all of a sudden, one of my students has a video that, that I have. He's playing it on in my class, and he sees this lifter, uh, you know, what he sees is banging the bar off the off the hips. Right. Nico Vlad was the lifter. He's a Romanian. He has beautiful vertical hips, but what my kid saw was banging the bar off the hips. Yeah. And so you're in this position, and now what are the kids trying to do? They're trying to bang the bar off the hips. Well, when you have 150 kilos on the bar and you bang it with your hip, it ain't going to go very it's far. It's not going to go very with, far. With 40 kilos, that's going to fly out. It's going to fly out there. So he can afford to smash it pretty hard because it ain't changing the bar right. It doesn't. It doesn't. You're absolutely correct. And my daughter, Sage, is a great example. She's totally vertical hips. Yeah. And you'll watch one of the videos that I have on my courses of her snatching. And you'll hear the bang. But I choose not to use the word bang because all of a sudden bang becomes you freaking banging it. Right. right you know, right. and it, it becomes, you know, something that I, I don't want. I choose not to teach them, you know. Right. So. It's, a, it's kind of the ankle extension, too. It's like generally something you don't teach them to extend their ankle. But if you do the pull right, you're going to extend. You're going to extend the ankle. The ankle. So exactly. actually I have a question on the, the hang. I've heard people recently talk about, and this is a point that I think like seven people are going to care about, but I don't care. I want to know what your thoughts are. <laughs> All right. seven of you. This yeah. is for you. <laughs> and that is, we classically talk about the triple extension. When we pull from the floor, the order of operations is you extend the hip and then the knee and then the ankle, right? The ankle flexion is, or extension is the last thing that happens. But with the hang, some people say you extend the knee, then the hip, and the ankle, and then others say it's the hip, ankle, knee, so it's the same order. I'm just wondering what your thoughts on the order from the hang. And what do I care? Yeah, okay. That's I mean, I told it, you, like seven it, people are going to care. Yeah, they, they are, but see, like, <laughs> like for me. He just was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no, think, think, took a flyer. think yeah. about this question. Good to, question, Andy. To the, to the 40-year-old housewife. Oh, yeah. Now, sure. do you extend the knee first, or the ankle first, or whatever? You know, yeah. you know what? I, I was taught this about, um, help, 40 years ago. And I'm talking ankle, knee, and hip extension to a group of 15, 16, and 17-year-olds. And later on, after the class was over with, this kid comes up to me, a little girl, 15 years old. She's a physics genius. And she says, well, Coach, well, is this what you're talking about? She says, well, why don't you just say jump? <laughs> That's what she says to me. And I'm going, well, shit, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the point is, is that I want to take complex movement patterns and not make them more complex. I right. want to take complex movement patterns and make them simple. So the jumping action, now I've got to do my coaching job here. So when I told you, I said, Andy, jump, you're going to jump. You know, what do you do? Your knees bend and you explode up. Now, how do I do that? Well, a lot of times when I jump, I jump on the balls of my feet. So now I've got to coach you to not... So not jump on the balls of your feet, but jump full foot as yeah. far as long as you can. And, and when that happens, in effect, your, your, your ankles extend, your knees extend, the hips go up, and you create acceleration on the barbell, like that jump rope where I go like this and the acceleration comes up. That's another thing she gave me. She says, Coach, just do that. And I'm going, shit. <laughs> you know, acceleration on the barbell, and when that barbell's going up, yeah. what am I doing? Yeah. Pulling myself down and around the barbell and punching my body through it. Yeah. So for me to try to be at your level intelligence-wise and think that way, hell, I can't do it. You know, but I can say... Well, I don't know if that's the right jump. way to term it, but well, it, I think the bigger point is, is like it maybe doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. For the vast majority of people. And, you know, you take a look at froning. Yeah. Okay, so you take a look at Froning, and Froning brings the bar into his hips with bent arms, right? And do I teach that? And, and well, first of all, would I ever want to ch change Froning? No. This guy's snatching 300 pounds, and he bends the arms in, and he gets a good whip, and he's got the best pull under that of anybody I've ever seen, including weightlifters. I've seen this guy's pull under the bar and drive himself. I see this, and it just amazes me. If I tried to change him, he would, first of all, he wouldn't do it, but second of all, he would absolutely have a falling off of performance. Yeah. You know, and uh, so you got to choose your battles, and you got to choose what you want to, you know, for me, you have the, the goals of, the, of my course is to teach coaches and trainers how to teach their clients. Yeah. But then my sub-goal is to be able to take a complex movement patterns and make them simple to achieve, to do, and to achieve. You gotta, they've got to be achievable. And if I can take my complex movement patterns and, 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 and make them very simple to understand and achievable, then I've done my job. You know, so, sorry, didn't want to get into no. <laughs> yeah, that. That's good. awesome. Yeah. So it, everybody's got, you know, the thing that I always say, there's a, I, you said it earlier, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. 
and the cat's going to get skinned. And I mean, I don't necessarily agree with the catapult method, but I know Don McCauley's mm-hmm. one of my buddies does. And if you take a look at everything from the ground to that scoop position, we're all the same. I mean, we're really all the same. And Don has a different way of explaining it than I do. I'm not going to argue with him. It works for him, and he does a good job with it. I, I was on the phone with him on the way up here. He said, you're full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> he probably did. <laughs> no, we have, this, we have this relationship that we both understand that he's not going to change my mind, and I'm not going to change yeah. his. But, you know, you can break it down, and you can look at it, and, and you think, well, Jesus, Don, you and I are teaching the same thing except for one component. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so for for people that aren't familiar with with the two sides of the fence, there, like what what is the catapult method, and and you know what are what are you teaching that's different? Well, for me, it's it's you know you bring the bar. We're talking about those positions, and you're right in here, and you're in this scoop position, and you're basically flat footed, and you know you're 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 flat footed, but the weight is centered, and you're balanced. The bar's close to your body here, and then you, for me, you drive the hips up. And pull yourself down and around. He probably ends up the catapult, as I understand it. And forgive me, Don. He's probably driving the hips more horizontal than I would teach with the hips going more upward. So for me, it's just it, it's a hard point to see that bar, you know, getting away from the body. Now I know he doesn't teach that. He wants that bar close to his yeah, body sure. as well. But I I think for a, an athlete that is learning this is that they're going to see that hip thing and the bar is going to have a tendency to get away from them. You know, so. It seems there's a hell of a lot more similar than different. Oh, absolutely. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind, mm-hmm. other than his stubborn personality. <laughs> yeah, because you're not stubborn. Sorry, sorry Doug. No, I'm not, no, I, no, I'm definitely not stubborn. You know, so. <laughs> you're both trying to get to the same place. You just you, you want to get there a little bit. Or you think it's better to get there a different way. Than well, is, we both place, we both part. want what's best for the weightlifter. Yeah. That's what we want to do. Mm-hmm. And and if somebody comes into my gym, if Don brought his athletes to my gym and he wasn't there, I'm not going to mess with him. He's got his his method of training. I respect his method. Uh, but if I have an athlete that's coming to me, then they're coming to me for instruction. I'm going to teach them my method, and I'm not going to deviate from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have athletes coming down here that definitely are bangers. I mean, they bang the bar off their hips, and the bar swings w- right around. And you can get away with that stuff with real light weight, but yeah. you can't get away with it when the weight gets heavy, you know. And and consequently, those guys that are bangers, typically I've seen that they might go three for six in a weightlifting contest. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, when the weight gets up there, you can you can see their their failure uh and a, another great example is you go to the crossfit games and you look at these the the snatch ladders when they go up and away to just thing and and if that bar is kept close to the bodies if that in, in that least line of resistance those guys really have a high success rate but the minute that that bar starts getting away from their bodies and that could be caused because their 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 finish is straight up and down instead of finishing mm. you know down and around the bar that that position of finish needs to be with open hips and the shoulders are leading me down and around the bar the shrug doesn't get the bar any higher but the shrug is leading me with a very high chest down and around the bar so that I can bring my body to the bar right if i try to bring the bar to my body with a heavy weight I'm swinging it. There's, yeah. there's just no way. And either that, or I'm going to be jumping forward to get it, mm. and that's very inefficient. You know, so. at, at what point do you tell someone, hey, you know what, your your technique's only going to get one or two percent better the whole rest of your life, and you really just need to take your front squat from 300 to 450? Like, well, when is that the advice you give? When they are, you know, power cleaning more than they're cleaning, and they're just not. They're not understanding the, the, the technique. They don't feel very comfortable in that front squat position. And what is a front squat? For me, a front squat is ass to the grass. It's ass to the ground. That's a front squat. And how many times in the CrossFit world or even the Olympic weightlifting world do, do athletes squat ass to the grass? And that becomes an issue right off the right off the bat mm-hmm. and so for me if i've identified this athlete that's power cleaning more than he's cleaning yeah you know it, it becomes i'm going to give him a ton of ass to the grass front squats in the whole front squats so that he becomes more comfortable and he's going to have a huge falling off of performance mm-hmm. at the beginning uh yeah th- these guys can you know they'll cl- they'll clean parallel to the ground and then uh, all of a sudden you know they'll get up with it but when they receive a heavy clean 
and they're driven all the way down to the ground. You see them bouncing 15 times to try to get past yeah, yeah, that yeah, sticking yeah. point. Mm. And so why not just why not just you know front squat there and get strong in that position anyway. Yeah. I don't know if you saw last competitive cycles numbers on the accuracy uh, of the pulls. In other words, I, I think it was juniors and at the uh, university nationals. But if you look at out of the six lifts in the competition, they were epically bad. Like the average was like 2.3 out of six or whatever the thing is. Right. I don't know exactly what it was. Pat Colin Carroll had it and he showed me. Those numbers might be off. But the point was they're very, very low. He wants them to be more like the group average should be like five out of six. Yeah, he exactly. should be making them. Right. So mm -hmm. any because he, he was like, I don't know why the hell is this happening. He has his theories. But any thoughts on why people are missing way more often than they have before? Well, is I, it just I, a numbers issue? There's more people? I, th I think that could be it. But the other point is, is that, you know, I know Pat and I have worked together extensively on, you know, as coaching teams together. He was part of Team Southern California yep. back in the day. But I will tell you this. We both had the philosophy that, number one, it's not where you start. It's where you end. And my goal is to try to get this athlete mentally as well as physically prepared. And so if an athlete says to me, you know, uh, I'm going to start with 90 kilos, and his best snatch is 90 kilos, then, you know, I'm going to have a hard time with that. So I may talk to this athlete, well, let's, you know, put down 90 kilos, and then, but I'm going to put down 80 as your first attempt. And we're going to warm up, and I'll see how you look. If you look really good, then, then you know, no problems. Yeah. We'll, we'll, you know, maybe let you start with 90, but I doubt it. You know, and I, and I would just control everything based on what the lifter looks like in the, in the end. And I've had... I've had various athletes. I had my son was a great one. Hell, he couldn't lift in the garage the week before the contest. He couldn't lift at all. I mean, his opener might be with 180 kilos in or 170 kilos in the snatch, and you know it's like, oh my God, he's missing 160. Uh, but hmm. I know that on game day, he was really prepared, and he could he could actually start with 172 or three. You know, and that, and because that's the way we trained him. And I knew that my relationship with him was very observant, and he and I had this camaraderie together, and so I could do that. But when I'd go to a world championships and I'd have to coach an athlete that I wasn't with, uh. that was really becomes a, a battle of wills and egos. And But I'm the coach, and so you're going to have to do what I say. And a lot of times my athletes didn't like that. And uh, But I made them do that anyway because it, at weightlifting at that point becomes a team sport, and your points become very important to us. Uh -huh. So you would watch the competition go, and, and you'd know that your athlete wants to start with – you know, 150 kilos in the snatch, but I'm going to start him with 145 because it's not where I start, it's where I end. So I'd like him 145 because he's got it. That's a no brainer for him. Uh -huh. He's going to make it 100 percent of the time unless he has a huge brain fart. But 145, then I might let him go to 152 or so, and then he'll end up where he wants to end up anyway. I lifted for uh, uh, OBX with Chris Wilkes, uh -huh. and he said the first big meet I did for him. He said the first first snatch is. Uh, for me, one hundred percent. Second one is, I mean, so me is in the coach. Oh, okay, like it yeah, was yeah, for yeah. Chris, right? Yeah, yeah. Because the second one is for the team, and the third one's yours. Yeah. So if mm. you get to all three, you can do whatever you want. You can go f to put a, pick right. a number, but first right. one is mine. Right. Second one is your team's, and then right. third you do. So if you miss along the way, well, then you're stuck at two or whatever. Yeah. Mm. But that's because it was a team issue. It's a team issue. But right. it was a good principle of him basically saying your opener should be one hundred percent. Right. Mm. Yeah. Not yeah. sixty, like yeah. one hundred percent. Your second, what he said, was seventy-five, and then. F Third, if you're there, depending on if you're going to place or you're worried about that, or if you're not placing, you don't care, it's a PR, then you just you know do whatever you want. Yeah. But get on the board right. and, and get something done. That was a very big point for us in the Pan American Championships. I had an athlete that absolutely, he was a great athlete, absolutely wanted to start too heavy, in my opinion, because the chances of him making that were not 100%. It was somewhere in around neighborhood of 70%, which mm -hmm. is still pretty high, yeah. but... You know, I dropped him down five kilos, and he was so mad at me that I dropped him down five kilos because that five kilos got us on the board, and it put us in a situation of meddling for the team. Yeah. So I dropped this opener down, and he was so furious with me. And then I said, okay, dude, we're, we we got the medal. What do you want for your second attempt? He went out and made it. Now what do you want for the third attempt? He went out and made it. He got a PR. <laughs> 
All I cared about was lowering his attempt so I could get one in. If I would have let him do what he wanted to do, and he would have gone out and missed that first one, that's a mind screw right there. Your your head is not squared away. Yeah. And that's 90% of the battle anyway is between the ears when you go out there. And if you don't have any confidence in, in lifting that weight, you miss that first one, and now you're going, uh-oh, you know, now what? So, you know, there, there was no, there was never any question on who was in charge when I did my... Yeah. My coaching. You Weightlifting know, right? meets are super fun once you've made your first snatch. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> then it's all fun. <laughs> then it's that's a, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Coach, where do we find you? Where do people find out more about what you're teaching? Oh, you do www.crossfitweightlifting.com. You have a, that's my, you know, website, you know, that we have. Uh, and it's dealing with programming. I I write a program for a very generic general program for anybody that wants to to follow it. And yeah, I even put my email address there if you have questions because I write these programs a week in advance and so I never go back to the to the website. So I give you my email address so if you have questions about my hieroglyphics of writing, how I write my style and stuff, you can ask me. And if I, if I've had a brain fart and I deleted, you know, how many sets I didn't put the sets in there, you can email me and say, "Hey, coach, how many sets are we doing on this?" You know, and you can get a hold of me there. There is a great website that I keep up. It's called Mike'sGym.org, and uh, I haven't been on there since 2014, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but the information goes from 2005 up to 2014, where I wrote some articles and, you know, for the NSCA and mm-hmm. a bunch of other stuff, and there are a lot of different programs in there that you can go to just go to the archives and then uh, mike bergener b-u-r-g-e-n-e-r at mac.com is my email address and god i'm gonna put this out there seven six zero five three five one eight three five is my home phone or my phone number where you can text me just keep, <laughs> keep it pg all right man. <laughs> Well, no, I'm no gonna, picks. You're going to go know, landslide I'm, of people I'm getting contacting a text, you. I'm getting a text next month from Coach B being like, I changed my phone number. Here's <laughs> <laughs> my new one. Can you take that video down? <laughs> Thank you. Actually, you know what? It's fun because uh, I'm retired, so I tell everybody this, that, you know, my wife, if, if you see all this plants and stuff around our house, is, that's her gig. And uh, she, if I don't get phone mo- messages or emails or text or whatever, then she wants me to work in the yard. <laughs> ah, and so I gonna, tell people, I'm keep, busy. Please, please call me. Please, please call, call me. call me. <laughs> keep me. Keep me busy so I don't have to do this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been really great. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. Thanks.